as we start now, let's let's not mess around. We're going to do the Michelin multiplier theorem today. Uh, so what do I need to remind you of from Tuesday? We we talked about what Fourier multipliers were. I hope you remember what a Fourier multiplier is. And we're going to talk about boundedness of them, operator valued Fourier multipliers. We have the operator valued Michelin theorem. Let's just write that out. Let's move my tablet to a better spot. Here we go. Operator valued Michelin theorem for UMD spaces. So the definitions we need to make just to talk about the, the assumptions that you need to make for the Michelin theorem to hold. There are not many definitions that need to be made. First, we need to talk about some distinguished dyadic intervals. Just a nice simple set. This is a script J. Script J is a kind of hard to write. Script J is the set of all intervals of the form two to the J up to two to the J plus one. And we can also flip that so that it's in the negative reals. So plus or minus two to the J, two to the J plus one over all integers J. And this is not standard terminology, but I like to call these Littlewood Paley intervals. Because they're the intervals that come up pretty prominently in the Littlewood Paley theorem, if you know that. And we'll do that later today as well. Will that J plus and J minus be the set of intervals, well, the set of Littlewood Paley intervals that are contained in the positive or negative reals? So we have the, the positive intervals, the negative intervals. We just need a bit of terminology to separate them. So these are the intervals that are going to be relevant to us. And the other definition we need to make is that the size condition on the the symbols of our multipliers that's going to make everything work. So given complex Banach spaces X and Y and a symbol M. So remember these are L infinity functions mapping into the bounded linear operators from X to Y. These will be the, the symbol of our Fourier multipliers. We call this, uh, we call M a Michelin symbol. If it is uh, continuous and differentiable, uh, not everywhere, but on on each Littlewood Paley interval. So notice here that the, the way that I've defined these Littlewood Paley intervals, these are open intervals, doesn't include either of the endpoints. So on each of these intervals, you've got continuity and differentiability, but the continuity and the differentiability is allowed to break down at the endpoints. That's completely fine. In fact, the multiplier doesn't even need to be defined at those endpoints because this is a set of measure zero and you can always abandon a set of measure zero with the symbol of a multiplier with no effect. So we just ask for continuity and differentiability on these open intervals. And we also have what's called a Michelin norm, which we use to measure the symbol. The Michelin norm has to be finite. And the Michelin norm is defined like this. This is a fractor M for the Germans, the non-Germans, it's, it's a German M. So that's the, the Michelin norm of the symbol is the R bound. So remember we talked about R bounds on Tuesday of sets of operators. It's the R bound of the set of operators given by the symbol at Xi and also Xi times the derivative of the symbol at Xi. Uh, and this is a, a set of operators that is contained in bounded linear operators from X to Y, just to be clear. This is, um, we let Xi vary over the union of all of the Littlewood Paley intervals. What did we call those? J. That's the Michelin norm. So if you recall the, the scalar Michelin theorem, which I introduced briefly on Tuesday, or if you've done it before, you need boundedness of the symbol and you also need some scale invariant boundedness of the derivative which means you need to have this Xi factor in front of the, the derivative to make everything scale invariant. 
So the, the derivative needs to be bounded, but it needs to have, the derivative needs to decay at infinity better than linearly. So that the psi that grows is compensated for. So you end up with a bound. But in this operator valued setting, it's not enough just to have uniform boundedness of these operators where you need R boundedness of the set. And the Clement Proust theorem from Tuesday says this, the fact that we're asking for the range of M to be R bounded is kind of necessary anyway. This derivative condition is not necessary, but at least for this theorem, we need it. Okay, these are the definitions we need. And then we can immediately say what the Mifflin theorem is for X and Y being complex UMD spaces. And for a Michelin symbol, that's a K there, Michelin symbol. Then for all compactly supported smooth F, because remember we're only initially defining Fourier multipliers on compactly supported smooth functions. And for all P, strictly between one and infinity, you have an LP estimate for the Fourier multiplier with symbol M. So let me just write that out. There's allowed to be a constant depending on P and X and Y. You will get the Michelin norm and you'll get the LP norm of F. All right, this is our Michelin multiplier theorem. So as, as I've said on Tuesday, the key difference between this and the scalar valued Michelin theorem, okay, first you have the UMD assumption on the Barnack spaces, that makes sense. You pretty much always need the UMD assumption when you're doing any kind of harmonic analysis in Barnack spaces. But this Michelin norm includes an R bound. And remember I was saying on Tuesday, R bounds are incredibly important. They are still incredibly important. This is pretty much necessary. The derivative condition is not, but yeah. That's our Michelin theorem. We're going to prove it today. We have most of the ingredients we need for the proof already. Just have to make a couple computations, prove another, another R bound. Remember that um, on Tuesday, we proved that the set of all Fourier projections onto intervals is R bounded when you look at UMD spaces, right? We're going to extend that to, I'll write out the lemma because the lemma is going to say what they say. Our first ingredient in this proves a lemma. <coughs> is everybody okay with the statement of the Michelin theorem? Seems so. Okay. We take two complex UMD spaces. You take P between one and infinity as always. Michelin symbol M. Then the set of truncated Fourier multipliers, or well, the truncated Fourier multiplier with symbol M. I'll define this. Set of truncated Fourier multipliers. These are the multipliers with symbol given by truncations of M over all littlewood Paley intervals I. So this is a set of operators. A priori, we don't know that they're bounded on LP, but part of the statement of this theorem is yes, they are bounded on LP. And you can guess the conclusion. This set is R bounded. It has R bound controlled by a constant depending on P and X and Y times the Michelin norm of M. So this isn't yet the boundedness of the Fourier multiplier with symbol M, but it says that if we truncate M to every little word Paley interval, then all of these operators are uniformly bounded and in fact R bounded. The collection is R bounded. Which turns out to be important in the proof of boundedness of the multiplier with symbol M.
Incidentally, if you consider the symbol, the constant symbol, M being the identity operator on X, then this is the R boundedness of the set of all Fourier projections onto little wood Paley intervals, which is a subset of all intervals. So if M is the identity, then this already holds. We already know this. But we're going to use that result in the proof of this. This can be seen as like bootstrapping up the R boundedness of Fourier projections to the R boundedness of truncated Fourier multipliers. So let's prove this. We're just going to consider Littlewood Paley intervals in J plus. So the intervals that are contained in the positive reals, because you can split this set of Littlewood Paley intervals into two sets, the negative ones and the positive ones. You can prove the R bounds individually, and then you can combine them. Remember I said on Tuesday, if you have a set and you want to show that it's R bounded, if you can split it into finitely many sets that are R bounded, then the set is R bounded. That's what we're doing here, splitting it into two sets, positive and negative, dealing with them separately. It just makes the notation easier to deal with. So we'll just consider positive intervals. And for all of these intervals, let's write the interval as having left endpoint L of I, right endpoint R of I, just to give the left and right endpoints a name. And we define mid of I to be the midpoint of the interval. So that's the left endpoint plus the right endpoint on two. We just need this terminology. And what we're going to do is we're going to write out the symbol of this truncated multiplier and reduce it down to Fourier projections in a clever way. So for Xi and the interval I, let's write out the symbol. Here's the symbol of our multiplier, that we, well, the multipliers that we're dealing with. We're going to deal with all of these. What we do is we use the, the fact that M is differentiable on I and use the fundamental theorem of calculus and write it out as an integral of its derivative. And we're going to do this around the midpoint for technical reasons. So let's write, oh, hang on, I'm, not, I'm looking at the wrong line. Sorry. Yep. So we have the value at the midpoint plus the integral from the midpoint to Xi. This is either, either Xi is greater than or less than the midpoint. So this integral could be negative depending on the orientation. Integral of the derivative, like that. This is true. And for technical reasons, we're going to write that a bit differently. We keep this midpoint term and we're gonna write this integral from the midpoint to Xi, <coughs> excuse me, as the integral from the left end point to Xi. So of M dash minus the integral from the left end point to the midpoint. And this is still true. Yep. So we simplify that a little bit, collect some terms. Let's write it like this. Collect all of the terms that we can. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, I'm just confusing myself. Let me write it out first and then explain it. This term that's left over here, this term that I haven't written out yet, we're going to write that as the integral over all of i of the characteristic function from eta to the right endpoint of psi. Maybe I'll scroll right a little bit. Times m dash of eta. And if you check carefully, this is true. Because in this integral here, eta is between the left endpoint of i and psi. So in particular, psi is greater than eta. So here's where that eta comes in. And psi is left less than the right endpoint of i. So this is just a clever way of re-parameterizing the integrals here. Now, the reason this representation is useful is that, so therefore, when you look at the truncated Fourier multiplier, you can write it as 
the Fourier projection of f that's coming from this characteristic function here. You have some extra terms, m of the midpoint of i minus the integral on the left half of i of the derivative of m. That's just an operator that multiplies out the front of the Fourier multiplier. Because you see that there's no eta dependence in this bracketed term. So it contributes to the Fourier multiplier just as a multiplier at the front it has nothing to do with the Fourier side at all. And then you have another term here, which is the integral just to change variables instead of integrating over i for each i, I'm going to integrate over the integral from one to two and do a change of variables. So integral from one to two, you will have a Fourier projection that looks like this. We're going to integrate in t. So that Fourier projection comes from this characteristic function here. And as before, everything else is eta independent. So we just get this m dash term and the change of variables makes it look like this. And that should be correct. So the upshot of all of this is that if you use the fundamental theorem of calculus, you can represent this truncated multiplier as being like reducing down to a superposition of Fourier projections. That's the point of all of this. You get a Fourier projection here, get some Fourier projections there, depending on T. And then everything else is just in terms of the simple M. This is going to let us use the R boundedness of the Fourier projections and the assumptions on the Michelin norm of the symbol. So let's prove the R bound using this identity here. Let's consider a sequence of functions, uh, f sub i indexed over intervals, so positive little or paley intervals. And we'll estimate the R bounds of the three summands individually. So the three summands are this one, this one, and this one. So for the first one, what we need to estimate is this. We need to take the Rademacher average of m of the midpoint of some interval times the Fourier projection of that interval times the function f indexed by the intervals. We're doing a Rademacher average. Let's write epsilon sub j plus to mean a Rademacher average indexed by the set j plus. And we have to estimate this in LP using this bullet notation to mean we put i in all of these spots for every i in the indexing set. So by definition of the R bound, this is less than or equal to the R bound of the set M of mid I as the intervals I vary over J plus. And this is times the Rademacher average of the Fourier projections applied to these functions. Now these are valued in X. This R bound here this is controlled by the Michelin norm of M. So just to remind you what the Michelin norm is, let's just scroll back up. This is the Michelin norm. We have an R bound of the set of the range of M times the range of the derivative of M rescaled. So in particular, what we're looking at down here is a subset of the range of M. So this R bound, R bound of a subset is less than the R bound of the larger set. So this is less than the Michelin norm of M. Let's just write sub M, I won't bother writing the X and the Y. And we know that these Fourier projections are bounded on LP because X is UMD and P is between one and infinity. So we have a constant, let's write less sin, constant depends on P and X. This is bounded by the Rademacher average of the functions F, F sub I. Let's just write using R boundedness 
of Fourier projections on intervals. Does that make sense? It should sort of make sense. That's just the first term. That's the term one here. We have three terms to deal with. Let's do the second one. For the second term, the Rada market average that we're estimating looks like this, just changing the variables. So I could write this from, did I not change the variables above? No, I didn't. Let me write, I forgot to change variables here. I don't want it to be integrating over I, I want it to be integrating over an interval that's independent of I. So I want to integrate from one to three on two, M dash of T length of I, DT length of I, like in the third term. I don't have to integrate over I for every separate I, I can just integrate over a fixed interval, but change variables depending on I. That's gonna be technically useful. So we have this writer market average here. I realize it's um, the way that I write these writer market averages is a little bit confusing if you're not used to it. Are people confused by what this writer market average actually means? People might not want to admit that. I'm just going to write out explicitly what it is just this once because undoubtedly this is a bit confusing. This is a, an average over the sum over all i and j plus of a Rada market variable e sub i times this term in here. This bullet is just shorthand for i. This is an LP and just the normalization is it's an L2 average. Is that clear? It's definitely longer to write it out this way. That's why I prefer to just write it the first way with the bullet. You don't have to write out the sum. You don't have to write out the writer market variables. So the way we estimate this term, because this integral doesn't depend on I, I mean, the stuff in the integral depends on I, but the, the domain of integration doesn't depend on I, we can take it out of the norm, just using the triangle inequality. Basically, we can take this integral here, we can put it there outside the sum, and then we can put the norm inside the integral. So this is less than or equal to the integral from one to three halves of the stuff on the inside. Did I forget a T here? Yes, I did. Wait, no, I didn't. <laughs> Sorry. I want there to be a T there, so I'm going to put a T in there and I'm going to compensate for it by putting a DT on T <laughs> on the outside. So I've multiplied and divided by T. So just, we have this Rademacher average here. dt on t. All right. What we'll do is we'll prove an estimate for each t, which is going to be uniform in t, and then we just integrate in t. We're on a bounded interval. That integral is just going to contribute a constant. It doesn't really matter. So if you just think of a fixed t in this integrand, let's make that bracket look a little bit nicer. We can control this by the r bound of these things that are multiplying the Fourier projections. This is over all positive littlewood Paley intervals I. Times the Rademacher average with Fourier projections. We know how to deal with that. DT on T. And just as in the first term, this R bound here, this is controlled by the Euclidean norm. Because what we're looking at is Xi M dash Xi for some particular values of Xi in the union of all the little Paley intervals. So we're looking at an R bound of a subset of a set for which we know what the R bound is. So we can say, right, that's bounded by the Euclidean norm independently of T because for each value of T, we just pull out that big global R bound. 
we will have the integral from one to three on two dt on t. I don't care what that is, it's log three on two, but I don't care. Uh, we have a constant depending on p and x because we're going to use the r boundedness of the Fourier projections. And I think I've handled everything there. This is just a constant, it doesn't matter. It's absorbed into the, the symbol over here. Let's put all of this over there. Very good. So that's the second term dealt with. Just as a reminder, we're proving an R bound here of this set of operators. So what we're doing is controlling one Rademacher average by another Rademacher average with the operators removed, basically, right? So that's the first and second terms. So we've dealt with one, we've dealt with two. And if you look at term three, we're gonna deal with that in exactly the same way as term two. We're gonna pull the integral out, use the Micklin norm to handle this first part, use the R boundedness of Fourier projections on intervals for the second part. It's exactly the same argument. I'm not gonna do it again. Literally the same argument as part two. So three, the same as two. And I think that completes the proof. So let's just remind ourselves, what do we prove? We prove that these truncations of the Fourier multiplier with symbol M onto Littlewood Paley intervals give an R bounded set of operators by reducing down to Fourier projections. Basically this Micklin norm that we defined, it works exactly such that you can write your symbol M as superpositions of Fourier projections. And this is ultimately boiling everything down to boundedness of the Hilbert transform, because that's how we showed the R boundedness of the Fourier projections. So it's all coming together. That's that done. Any questions before we do the next lemma? Anyone hopelessly confused? You can admit that, it's okay. <laughs> but nobody will. All right. That's what office hours are for. So let's move on to the next lemma. We're trying to show that the Fourier multiplier with symbol M is bounded. And so far all we've done is shown a bunch of technical things about R boundedness of certain collections of operators. We need to somehow connect this to boundedness of the operator TM. So one of the ingredients we need for this is something we proved last week. It was one of the consequences of these bounds on dyadic shift operators and average dyadic shifts and things. And I'll say what the estimate is. Let's take the function phi of x to be what we would have called phi superscript h last week. So when we have an admissible base function k, which is a linear combination of half functions, we can get this function phi that comes out of that. Phi superscript h is h of x plus u integrated against h of u du, where h is the half function. h looks like that, square wave, right? We're gonna take our admissible base function k to be h itself, rather than taking some fancy linear combination of smaller half functions, we just take the base half function. Incidentally, this integral is h convolved with the reflection of h, and that's a representation we're gonna need later. You can compute phi explicitly. I actually made it an exercise in the notes to compute phi explicitly, but in this case, unlike the previous week where we actually took a different K and computed what phi was, we don't need to know what phi is. All we need to know is this. That's good enough for us at this point. If, you want, if you're curious, phi looks like this. That's what phi looks like, but you don't need to know that. So for all Littlewood Paley intervals i, let's write my script j a bit nicer. We will define phi sub i to be this dilation of phi, just for technical reasons. This is the one on two times length of i L1 normalized dilation. We did have a different definition of, um, of k sub i last week where k is an admissible base function, which is like translating it around to the location of i and so on. 
This is a different definition. Forget the definition from last week. If you don't remember it, even better. This is a new definition. And the lemma that we proved, this is just a reparameterization of a lemma we proved last week. If X is UMD, it doesn't need to be complex. It can be real. Piece between one and infinity. Then for all, X valued LP functions F. If you take the convolution of F with phi sub I for all little or Paley intervals, either positive or negative, and take a Rademacher average of that, this is controlled up to a constant depending on P and X by the LP norm of F. And there's no Rademacher average on the right hand side. That's an important thing. So this lemma says that a, a certain Rademacher average with convolutions with these dilations of this function phi is controlled by, well, is a bounded operator on LP from LP to the Rademacher space. In fact, this is a square function estimate in the harmonic analysis terminology. If you don't know that, don't worry about it. So as I said, we actually proved this last week. This is just a sort of reparameterization of the thing we proved then. So I'll just say what it was last week. We proved the way that I wrote it out last week was this. Sum from J equals M to N epsilon sub J phi dilated by two to the minus J convolved with F. This Rademacher average is bounded by the LP norm of F. And this is true for all M less than or equal to N these are integers. This is probably more familiar from last week. We had this average dyadic shift and we had this probability measure nu that goes from one to two. And by choosing nu to be a delta function, we come up with this in the end. And because we're using truncated dyadic shift operators, we had to fix it, these scales M and N that we stop at. So by an exercise way back in the notes, by exercise, what number is it? 5.2. This is an exercise in the section on Rademacher averages. We can take the limit as M goes to minus infinity, N goes to infinity. And that leads us to the estimate that we want basically. with the Rademacher average indexed by the integers. And this is pretty much the result, although it's indexed a bit differently. What we want is this Rademacher average indexed by the little Paley intervals, either positive or negative. Actually, I'm using, yeah, either positive or negative, one or the other. But we have a Rademacher average indexed by the integers. All we need to use is the fact that the set of two to the minus j, where j is an integer, is equal to the set of numbers one on two times length of i over all little or Paley intervals, either positive or negative. Because the lengths of the little or Paley intervals range over the numbers two to the j for all j and z. And if you multiply that set by two, it doesn't change the set, of course. right? So this is just a re-indexing of that result. So this estimate that we proved here, this is gonna let us connect results concerning R boundedness, like R boundedness of these truncated Fourier projections. It'll let us convert those into boundedness results for Fourier multipliers. Somehow we need to introduce some Rademacher averages so that we can control the Rademacher averages and eventually control them by the norm of f. There's still some technicalities in doing that, but that's what we need to do. Now I've got written on my notes here, early break with question mark, because I thought this might be a logical point for a break. And I think it is, and it is early as well. So let's have a break. Are there any questions? Okay. Calvin has a question in the chat. Oh, sorry. Uh, yes. 
not so much a question as it is a correction. Yeah. That's right. Thanks. Okay. If there are no other corrections, <laughs> then let's have that break. <laughs>